after five. After lunch, I headed to my favorite class, Advanced Oasis Studies. And this was a senior year, senior year elective where you learned about the history of the Oasis and its creator. Talk about an easy A. For the past five years, I devoted all of my free time to learning as much as possible. As I possibly could about James Halliday, I'd exhaustively studied his life, accomplishments, and interests. Over a dozen different Halliday biographies had been published in the years since his death. I read them all. Several document documentary films had been made about him, and I studied those too. I studied every word Holiday had ever written, and I'd been, I played every video game he'd ever made. I took notes, writing down every detail I thought might be related to the hunt. I kept everything in a notebook, which I started to call my grail diary after watching the third Indiana Jones uh, film. The more I learned about Halliday's life, the more I'd grown to idolize him. He was a god among geeks, a nerd, uber deity, on the level of Gygax, Gary, and Gates. He'd left home after high school with nothing but his wits and his imagination, and he'd used them to attain a worldwide fame and a massive vast fortune. He'd created an entirely new reality that now provided an escape for most of humanity. And to top it all off, he turned his last will and testament into the greatest video game contest of all time. I spent most of my time in the advanced ways to studies class annoying our teacher, Mr. Siders, pointing out errors in our textbook and raising my hand to interject some relevant bit of holiday trivia that I, and I alone, thought was interesting. After the first few weeks of class, Mr. Siders had stopped calling on me unless no one else knew the answer to his question. Today, he was reading excerpts from The Eggman, a best-selling holiday biography that I had read four times. During the, his lecture, I kept having to resist the urge to interrupt him and point out that all the really important details of the book were left out. Instead, I just made a mental note of each omission, and as Mr. Siders began to recount the circumstances of holiday childhood, I once again tried to glean whatever secrets I could from the strange way holiday had lived his life, and from the odd clues about himself he'd chosen to leave behind. James Donovan Halliday was born June 12, 1972, in Middletown, Ohio. That's where my husband was from. He was an only child, and his father was an alcoholic machine operator, and his mother was a bipolar waitress. By all accounts, James was a bright boy, but socially inept. He had an extremely difficult time communicating with all the people around him, despite his obvious intellect intelligence, and he did poorly in school because of most of his attention was focused on computers, comic books, sci-fi, fantasy novels, movies, and above all else, video games. One day in junior high, Halliday was sitting alone in a cafeteria reading Dungeons and Dragons Player Handbook, and the game fascinated him, but he'd never actually played it because he'd never had any friends to play it with. The boy in his class named Ogden Morrow noticed that Halliday was reading and invited him to attend one of the weekly D&D gaming sessions that he held at his house. There, and Mal Morrow's basement, Holiday was introduced to an entire group of mega geeks, just like himself. I am also a mega geek. I like candy. They immediately accepted him as one of their own, and for the first time in his life, James Holiday had a circle of friends. Ogden Morrow became Holiday's business partner, collaborator, and best friend. Many would later in life liken him to the pairing of Morrow and Holiday to that the Jobs in Rosnick or Lennon and McCartney, and it was a partnership destined to alter the course of human history. At age 15, Halliday created his first video game, Anorex Quest. He programmed it in BASIC, a TRS-80 color computer he'd received in the previous Christmas, though he'd asked his parents for a slightly more expensive Commodore 64. Anorex Quest was the adventure game that's set in uh, Cthulhu. The fantasy world Holiday had created for his high school Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Anorak was a nickname Holiday had been given by a female British exchange student in high school. He liked the name. Anorak was so much used for his favorite D&D character, the powerful wizard who later appeared in many of the video games. Holiday created Anorak's quest for fun to share with the guys in his D&D gaming group. They all found the game addictive and lost countless hours attempting to solve its intricate red riddles and puzzles. Ogden Morrow convinced Holiday that Anorak's Quest was better than most of the computer games currently on the market and encouraged him to try selling it. He helped Holiday create some simple cover artwork in the game for the game, and together the two of them hand copied Anorak's Quest onto dozens of five and a quarter inch floppy disks and stuck them into a Ziploc bag. So that five and a 
quarter inch floppy disk is actually what you see as the save button in case you didn't already know that. But that's what the save button looks like. It's a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. Uh, save them in Ziploc bags along with a single photocopied sheet of instructions. They began selling the game on the software rack at their local computer store. Before long, they couldn't make copies fast enough to meet the demand. Morrow and Holiday decided to start their own video game company, Gregarious Games, which initially operated out of Morrow's basement. Holiday programmed new versions of Anorex Quest with Avatar 8800XL, Apple II, and Commodore 64 computers, and Morrow began placing ads for the game in the back of several computer magazines. Within six months, Anorex Quest became a national bestseller. Holiday and Morrow almost didn't graduate from high school because they spent most of their senior year working on Anorex Quest 2, and instead of going off to college, they both focused all of their energy on their new company, which had now grown too large for Morrow's basement. In 1990, Gregarious Games moved to its first real office located in a rundown strip mall of Columbus, Ohio. Over the next decade, a small company that took the video game industry by storm, releasing a series of best-selling action and adventure games all using the groundbreaking first-person graphics engine created by Halliday. Gregarious Games set a new standard for the immersive gaming and other and everything they released a new title, it pushed the envelope for what seemed possible for the computer hardware available at the time. The rotund Ogden Maro was naturally charismatic and he handled all of the company's business affairs and public relations. At every Gregarious Games press conference, Morrow grinned infectiously from behind his unruly beard and wire rim spectacles, using his natural gift for hype and hyperbole. Halliday seemed to be Morrow's polar opposite in every way. He was tall, gaunt, and painfully shy. He preferred to stay out of the limelight. People enjoyed buying. People employed by Gregarious Games during this period said that Holiday frequently locked himself in his office when he programmed incessantly, often going without food, sleep, or human contact for days or even weeks. On the occasion that Holiday agreed to do interviews, his behavior came off as bizarre, even by game designer standards. He was hyperkinetic, aloof, and socially inept, and the inter interviews often came away with the impression that he was mentally ill. Holiday tended to speak so rapidly that his words were often unintelligible, and that he had a disturbingly high-pitched laugh, made even more so because he was usually the only one who knew what he was laughing about. When Holiday got bored during an interview or conversation, he would usually just get up and walk away without saying a word. Halliday had many known obsessions. Chief among them were classic video games, sci-fi and fantasy novels, and movies of all genres. He had an extreme fixation of the 1980s, a decade during which he'd been a teenager. Holiday seemed to expect everyone around him to share his obsession, and he often lashed out to those who didn't. He was known to fire longtime employees for not recognizing an obscure line of movie dialogue he quoted. Or, if he discovered that they weren't familiar with one of his favorite cartoons, comic books, or video games, Ogden Morrow would always hire the employee back, usually without Holiday ever noticing. As the years went on, Holiday's already stunted social skills seemed to deteriorate even further. Several exhaustive psychological studies were done on Holiday following his death, and an obsessive adherence to routine and preoccupation with a few obscure areas of interest led many psychologists to conclude that Holiday had suffered from Asperger's syndrome, which was one of the or from some other high-functioning autism. So we actually don't call it Asperger's syndrome anymore. We just call it the uh, autism spectrum disorder and Asperger's is on uh, just the furthest end of um, the autism spectrum disorder. So we don't actually say uh, Asperger anymore, but um, Asperger's, people that have Asperger's uh, refer to themselves as Aspies sometimes, but um, ask if you know someone that has Asperger's, please ask them if that's okay to call them that or to acknowledge it at all if that is something that you uh, are interested in. All right, so by the end of the 20th century, Halliday was widely recognized as the greatest video gamer of his generation, and some would argue of all time. Ogdemar was a brilliant programmer in his own right, but his true talent is an act of business. In addition to collaborating with the company's games, his mastermind for all of their early marketing campaigns and shareware distributing schemes without an astounding result where Gagarius Games finally went public, their stock immediately shot into the stratosphere. By their 30th birthdays, Halliday and Morrow were both multimillionaires. They purchased mansions on the same street. Morrow bought a Lamborghini, took several long vacations, and traveled the world. Halliday bought and restored one of the original DeLoreans used in Back to the Future films, continued to spend nearly all of his time 
welded to a computer keyboard and used his newfound wealth to amass what would eventually become the world's largest private collection of classic video games, Star Wars action figures, vintage lunchboxes, and comic books. At the height of his success, Gregarious Games appeared to fall dormant. Several years elapsed, during which they released no new games. Morrow made a cryptic announcement saying the company was working on an ambitious project that would move them into an entirely new direction. Rumors began to circulate that Gregarious Games was developing some sort of new computer gaming hardware that the secret projects were rapidly exhausting the company's considerable financial resources. That with the indication that both Holiday and Mart invested most of their personal fortunes in the company's new endeavor. Word began to spread that Gregarious Games was in danger of going bankrupt. Then, in December of 2012, Gregarious Games rebranded itself as Gregarious Simulation System, and under this new banner, they launched their flagship product, the only product GSS would ever release, the Oasis. The anthology anthropomorphic sensory immersion simulation, the Oasis would ultimately change the way people around the world live worked and communicated. It would transform entertainment, social networking, and even global politics. Even though it was initially marketed as a new kind of massively multiplayer online game, the Oasis quickly evolved into a new way of life. In the days before the Oasis, massive, massively multiplayer online games, MMOs, were among the first shared synthetic environment. They allowed thousands of players to simultaneously coexist inside a simulated world, which they connected to via the internet. The overall size of these environments was relatively small, usually just a single world or a dozen or so small planets. And then low players could see these online environments through a small two-dimensional window, their desktop computer monitor. And they could interact by using keyboards, mice, and other crude and apt devices. Gregarious simulation systems elevated the MMO concept to an entirely new level. The Oasis didn't limit its users to just one planet or even a dozen. The Oasis contained hundreds or even and eventually thousands of high resolution 3D worlds for people to explore. And that was beautiful rendering from meticulously graphical detail right down to the bugs and blades of grass, wind and weather patterns. Users could circumvent each of these patterns and never see the same terrain twice. Even if it's first primitive incarnation Incarnation, the scope of the simulation was staggering. Alade Amaro referred to the Oasis as an open source reality, a malleable online universe that anyone could access via the internet. Using their existing home computers or video game console, you could log in and instantly escape the drudgery of your day to day life. You could create an entirely new person for yourself and, complete, and with complete control over how you looked and sounded to others. In the Oasis, the, the fat could become thin, the ugly could become beautiful the shy, extroverted, or vice versa. And you could change your name, age, sex, race, height, weight, voice, hair color, and bone structure. Or you could cease to being human altogether and become an elf, ogre, alien, or any other creature from liter literature, movies, or mythology. In the Oasis, you could become whomever or whatever you wanted to be without ever revealing your true identity because a non anonymity was guaranteed. Users could also alter the content of the virtual worlds inside the Oasis and create an entirely new one. A person's online presence was no longer limited to a website or social networking profile. In the Oasis, you could create your own private planet, build a virtual mansion from it, furnish and decorate however you'd like, and invite a few thousand friends over for a party. And those friends could be a dozen different time zones spread all over the globe. The keys to success in Oasis were two new pieces of inter interface hardware that GSS had created, both of which require access to the simulation, the Oasis visor and the haptic gloves. The wireless one-size-fits-all Oasis visor was slightly larger than a pair of sunglasses, and it used harmless low-power lasers to draw the stunningly real environment of the Oasis right into the viewer's retinas, completely immersing their entire field of vision in the online world. The visor was light years ahead of the chunky virtual reality goggles available prior to the time, and it represented a paradigm shift in virtual reality technology. It, as did the lightweight Oasis haptic gloves, which allowed users to directly control the hand of their avatar and interact with their simulated environment as if they were actually inside it. When you picked up objects, opened doors, or operated vehicles, the haptic gloves made you feel these non-existent objects and surfaces as if they were really there in front of you. The gloves let you, as the television adds, but it reach in and touch the Oasis. Working together, the visor and the gloves made entering the Oasis an experience unlike anything else available. And once people got a taste of it, there was no going back. 
The software that powered the simulation, Halliday's new Oasis reality engine, was also represented a huge technological breakthrough. It managed to overcome limitations that had plugged previous simulated, simulated realities. In addition to restricting the overall size of the virtual environments, earlier MMOs had been forced to limit their virtual populations, usually to a few thousand users per server. If too many people were logged in at the same time, the simulation would slow to recall and avatars would freeze mid-stride and seem to struggle to keep up. But the Oasis utilized a new kind of fault-tolerant server array that could draw additional processing power from every computer connected to it. And at the time of its initial launch, the Oasis could handle up to 5 million simultaneous users with no discernible latency and no chance of a system crash. The massive marketing campaign promoted the launch of Oasis and the pervasive television billboard and internet ads featured a lush green Oasis, complete with palm trees and pool of crystal blue water surrounded on all sides by a vast barren desert. GSS's new endeavor was a massive success from day one. The Oasis was what people had been dreaming of for decades. The virtual reality that had become promised for so long was finally here, and it was even better than they'd imagined. The Oasis was an online utopia, a holodeck for home, and its biggest selling point, it was free. Most online games of the day generated revenue by charging users a monthly subscription fee for access. GSS only charged a one-time sign-up fee of 25 cents, for which it received a lifetime Oasis account. The ads all used the same tagline, the Oasis, the greatest video game ever created, and it only cost a quarter. At the time of drastic social and cultural upheaval, when most of the world's population longed for an escape from reality, the Oasis provided it in a form that was cheap, legal, safe, and not medically proven to be addicted. The ongoing energy crisis contributed greatly to the Oasis runaway popularity. The skyrocketing cost of oil made airline and automobile travel too expensive for the average citizen, and the Oasis became the only getaway most people could afford. As the area of cheap, abundant energy drew to a close, poverty and unrest began to spread like a virus. Every day, more and more people had a reason to seek solace in Halliday and Mara's virtual utopia. Any business that wanted to set up a shop inside the Oasis had to rent and purchase a virtual real estate, which Mara dubbed surreal estate. From GSS, anticipating this, the company had set aside Sector 1 as a simulation designated business zone and began to sell rent millions of blocks of surreal estate there. City-sized shopping malls were erected to the blink of an eye. Storefronts spread across planets like time-lapse footage of mold devouring an orange. Urban development had been so easy. In addition to the billions of dollars GSS rent raked in selling land that didn't actually exist, they made a killing selling virtual objects and vehicles. The Oasis became such an integral part of people's day-to-day -day social lives that they were more and more willing to shell out real money to buy accessories for their avatar. Clothing, furniture, houses, flying cars, magic swords, machine guns. These items were nothing but ones and zeros stored in the Oasis server, but they were also status symbols. Most items cost only a few credits, but since they were, the cost was nothing for GSS to manufacture, it was all profit. Even if the throes of ongoing economic recession, the Oasis allowed Americans to continue engaging in their favorite pastime, shopping. The Oasis quickly became a single most popular use for the internet, so much so that the term Oasis and internet gradually became synonymous. And the incredibly easy to use three-dimensional Oasis OS, which GSS gave away for free, became the single most popular computer operating system in the world. Before long, billions of people around the world were looking and playing into the Oasis every day. Some of them met, fell in love, and got married without ever setting foot into the same continent. The lines of a distinction between a person's real identity and that of their avatar began to blur. It was the dawn of a new era. One where most of the human race now spent all of their free time inside of a video game. All right, so that is all that we're gonna do today. We are picking it up tomorrow with the rest of my school day passing. So chapter six, tomorrow.